Ravi, we're back. We are. <laughs> it's been some time, hasn't it? Jeez, when when, when like was the last it's... time we, we did this? <laughs> 2021, according to Apple Podcasts, which is what I had to go and check. Um, I've got a, a screenshot of Apple Podcasts here. It says 28th of April, 2021. Um, that's when it was released, but that's not when we last spoke. It would have been two weeks before that. So probably let's yeah. say mid-April, right? <laughs> Many people, yeah. I mean, this makes it sound like we've not spoken now for three years, and the only, <laughs> the only means of communication we have is is via this podcast. Is a podcast, absolutely, yeah. No, but um, it, it's good to be back. Honestly, I think um, uh, it, it's probably worth starting with introductions because we're doing things slightly differently this time around. So I'll let you go first. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Ravi. Um, Ravi Mystery. Um, for work, I work at a company called City Football Group. I'm head of football insights there. Um, I've used Tableau as my primary data visualization tool uh, since 20, I think it was end of January, early of February 2015. Um, since then, Tim and I worked together at a company called The Information Lab. Um, we are both data and tech um, professionals, geeks, nerds, whatever you can call it. Um, I think <laughs> um, in, in terms of, yeah. That, that's that's what we're about uh, my my personal interests lie within like yeah using using tech to augment our lives uh, mm -hmm. our work and also like what is the future of this this space within the industry right and i think you know yeah. we've, we've talked in the past around tableau specifically because that's sort of the crux of of what we what we know and what we work with but there's obviously all these um uh, technologies that surround it um we've talked about databases i think and another one so but yeah no um great to be back and great to be talking about this stuff data literacy is another thing data strategy data literacy. Yeah. i'm always yeah sort it's, of like it's two huge topics um i'd like to think everyone watching this on my channel knows who i am but yeah. <laughs> i'll, do, I'll mm -hmm. do an intro anyway um i guess uh the thing i'll start with actually i'm a consultant so you are right. very much uh uh you know on the other side of the fence from i crossed the bridge i crossed right? the bridge yeah oh you crossed the bridge okay fine fine so yeah, when we were at Information Lab, both consultants, you crossed the bridge, became, uh, uh, let's just say, a member of staff for now, uh, rather than like a consultant, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, for me, what I do for a living is I help companies work with data. Um, I work at Aimpoint Digital. I think a lot of people know that. But if you don't, check them out. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes, as I would say, to podcast right <laughs> that nearly caught me out i was about to say the description or comments but that's not the right thing here um there's there's another big thing that's changed right like i think right it's quite a few <laughs> yeah it's quite right. a few <laughs> but, but the first and primary one is you, you've gone big on youtube right like i have i have uh by if by big you mean like a drop in the ocean in youtube terms then yes um you know <laughs> we've we, we've crossed the threshold the what the threshold of a hundred thousand subscribers which is great um but uh, the, pl the plan was always to try and do the podcast alongside the youtube channel because i think um you videos videos tend to help people do very specific things but what the podcast allowed us to do is to talk about sort of the peripheral subjects around mm -hmm. the the many things that encompass not just tableau but the analytics sphere in general and so um this was very much a, an opportunity to scratch that itch in a in a more let's say structured format uh, we tried to put some structure to it and um I guess one of the only bits of structure we let down is uh, consistency. We we stopped for two years, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe not on that one. But um, we're back. We're pushing through. It's never too late to keep trying. So um, yeah, we're back. So yeah, no, really, really glad to be back. Um, obviously, a lot's changed for us in terms of life as well. You know. Um, I think our jobs have become vastly, vastly different since uh, we started the podcast. Big split, hasn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I think you've seen more of the, let's say, applied side of, uh, of, of, of analytics, whereas I've mm -hmm. seen more of the delivery and solution side of it. So I think we have an interesting, um, let's say, we stand at different sides of the same room, right? And yeah, we yeah. kind of see problems very differently. And in the same time, lots of new tools have come in to fill the space between, right? Because analytics is still one of these areas where the solutions of yesterday aren't yeah. solving the problems they have to. I think the other, the other thing is the difference between someone who's working as a member of staff, as you say, and the consultant. You work very slowly <laughs> within as a member of staff, right? Like, um, right. You know, it, talking about Tableau, we, we don't upgrade 
maybe once or twice a year, if that. And yeah. usually it's either a security patch or a, yeah, we want that feature or should probably upgrade sort of moment rather than a, no, we want the latest and greatest because we need to be using the full feature set. Um, same goes for problems, right? Like you, you're solving more specific business problems with a toolkit rather than yeah. the opposite or the other way around where you're bringing the toolkit to the problem as a specialist to accelerate and then you almost dip out. Um, whereas there's almost like the, um, the fallout of, of the work done um, is really what, what we end up dealing with, I guess, inside rather than outside as a consultant. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, in, in the... In our in our podcast, we kind of had these three types of uh, of formats, right? And I think it actually speaks to this this challenge. So I'll briefly touch on them. We have bytes, which are essentially just a normal show, us talking about specific topics. We have bits, which are um, essentially snippets from shows. So maybe us taking a, an extract from the show or talking about a very small topic for a very short amount of time. Yeah. And we had analogs, which were sort of discussions with guests. Um, we have a famous uh let's say curse on this show that everyone we seem to talk to ends up leaving the company they work for so <laughs> anna casey who i think who was our last guest yeah. left <laughs> has left yeah. tableau since yeah yeah uh before that uh kent um I, i'm not sure we can say it's a curse there because it's only happened twice if we had more more uh guests and we actually got on top of that maybe we'd we would sort of turn the tide a little bit but nonetheless we'd, we'd average out in the middle somewhere yeah, exactly, exactly. So that that's sort of the broad format of the show, and that's sort of how we kind of break this up. The other new thing here is obviously video. Um, uh, yeah, obviously I know this, but <laughs> video has become a big thing in the last three years. So um, it's really important for us to sort of add this element to um, the podcast. But actually, the podcast is the main thing. The conversation is the main thing, and if this is another avenue where we can share that conversation then that's great. So we're going to host the videos uh, for this, the podcast actually, um, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can find it in the usual places. But we'll also have the video podcasts uh, here on the Tableau Tim channel as a podcast. So uh, YouTube does a pretty good job of separating out my usual videos with the podcast. So if you just want to follow the podcast, uh, there's a way to do that through YouTube and through through Google. But if you want to catch everything else, then of course, just use Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That will get you going. So, um, what were our last two is shows? This where we like um, say is um, actually uh, we've also spoken about Anna, um, and then the previous show to that was about NFTs, Snowflake, and aggregators. <laughs> NFTs, so I think you had the hot take on NFTs. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're still hot, they're still rocking. They're still rocking. I think um, <laughs> and, uh, NFTs. I think will still play a big big part in the work life in in society. They just won't be yeah. monkeys or oh, sorry, bored apes or like JPEGs that people are using, right? Um, yeah. I think the, the authenticity part that we talked about in that podcast is going to become even more important, like that, especially yeah. in the world of AI, right? When we will talk about that today, I think. Um, yeah. But being able to trace the root of where something came from and who owns it is going to be really, really important. Um, yeah, I mean, blockchain is a great example of something that everyone uses but doesn't really realize they use. Like, yeah. if you've ever done a DocuSign document that is using encrypted blockchain technology, um, yeah. to in order to make sure it's you and there's a digital fingerprint on who you were, where you signed, what device you signed from, um, rather than you know just typing your name right. Even more necessary now in the world of AI. Um, we'll get to AI shortly because I think that is pretty much taken over every every technology company on the planet seems to need to or needs to be showing that it's working with AI. Um, but it, it's interesting because I think maybe NFTs were the start of that journey. There were NFTs, you had blockchain, you also had uh, crypto sort of have its big crash and, and rise. It seems to be on the rise again. Um, and... I, I'd, I'd sort of take one step back and say that's also when analytics products, I think, started to feel like they were becoming stale. Is that fair to say? I'd, I'd say so, but I'd argue against whether NFTs and blockchain almost push towards AI. Like, yes and no. I think the, the biggest push for <laughs> AI in general right. is really the, the computational resource. Um, I think right. compute is cheap these days. Um, the, the like network like network computing is a big thing as well. Like you're able to harness multiple computers around the world, even desktops in some cases, just to create this like 
bootstrapped supercomputer that is able to do multiple levels of processing. We saw this during COVID. Um, I was part of, um, I found this app Vodafone we're partnering with. We could leave your phone on overnight and it will be contributing to like your internet usage and your phone usage would be contributing to the algorithms cr cracking through what hopefully or could have been uh, one of the vaccines. And this was the first idea of like network computing that I saw. But I think that you know, AI and large language models for sure are really the basis of just computing rather than um, anything to do with blockchain. I think both of those things will definitely be enhanced, um, but I don't think it will be the be all or end all. I, but I, I will argue that question, I think NVIDIA was at the heart of both of those trends. And I wonder if they would have been able to capitalize on AI had they not benefited from the boom of crypto um, that they also benefited from. And they were sort of there for two big trends. And I wonder if the first one was a necessary, was a ne there was a necessary upside in that for, to allow them to invest in AI, to make them become the de facto, or currently they're basically the only show in town. Yeah, that's interesting. But to answer your question, um, how did, it is almost AI coming or, or coinciding with analytics products becoming stale. I don't think they became stale. I think they stopped moving, um, which might be two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. <laughs> yeah. Um, and by that, I mean, you must forget why you existed in the first place. Like the problem you're trying to solve, is it still the yeah. same problem? Have you solved that problem in some cases? And do you need to think of what the new problem is? And I think, not not having the ability to stop and take stock and be like, you know what? And this is, this is the problem of any company in general, right? You can't just stop and be like, we're going to just think for a moment. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Um, yeah, you don't, you don't, you're not able to do that. So I don't know. I think st st going stale is is because they, they probably backed the wrong horse with the platforms, right? When, when they should have, when they right. went to become a singular platform, that served everything. Mm -hmm. They should have been a disaggregator where we're like, you know what, you, you can plug us into anything and we'll do our job. Is this part of whatever you want it to be? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting one. I, I, I still think like the, the moment you realize uh, an industry needs innovating is always a year or two later than it should have been doing that change. Right. So when I say 2021 is when things were going stale, I don't think, I could have gone to the 2021 version of Tim and said things were getting stale because I think at that time I was still excited. Um, but I think looking back at it now, um, and you can see the, the the major pivot a lot of analytics companies have taken, I think it's clear to see that actually they lost they lost their focus on the mission, which was just helping people answer questions in the most in the most quickest and efficient way. And instead, they almost productized and focused on on how to. Not to how to do that, not how to do that for you, but it's your it's your point you keep making about dashboards are going to die, right? It's it is the thing that people need dashboards, or is the thing that people need answers? And what's the fastest way to enable people to do that? And I, I feel like with AI, they've had the second wind of realizing that it's the answers that matter more than the dashboards, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think it's it's this is where the rethink will happen. I think there's there's a popular. <laughs> visualization company that would say, yeah, dashboards are dead as that's big slogan as a big sort of shock factor. Um, I've, I've with never seen and end with T. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've never said dashboards are dead. I think that the future is dashboardless, right? Like almost like serverless is a thing where you have yeah. an error, like compute compute that has um, no, um, no sort of head effectively. Um, mm -hmm. It's just it turns on, does its thing, turns off, and this is what I this is almost effectively what what I was trying to say like a couple of years ago when I wrote about that. But I think the yeah the 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 ability to ask a question and get a rich answer is nice. Um, I think LLMs will be able to solve some of the problems. I right now I see them as assistants, right? Like they're then they're not a knowledge hub yet. Um, yeah. You know, you've got all these like shadow ai stuff like if you let's take a really simple example where you give it some sql code and you say this doesn't work why mm -hmm. and it'll be like oh you need to build this cte and then you drop it in and it's like well that still doesn't work it's now doing what i didn't want it to oh sorry yeah. i misunderstood your question hit this one should work 
and really that, that that that's become the consultant right <laughs> the intern consultant yeah <laughs> it's the, the the experience isn't quite there you still have to guide it a little bit but yeah it's it's actually capable of doing the things with a very prescribed set of directions yeah and this this is why like almost on linkedin on twitter uh you, you see those viral trends that say like here's your the top 100 ai prompts you need so well, you don't really need an area prompt. You need to work out how you use G chat GPT to answer your questions. Um, more yeah. Than anything. So yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it's so. changing. I think the flow is changing. Is probably the more important pertinent question here. What is the analyst's flow in twenty twenty four? And who's the analyst as well? I, I think there's a, there's a bit of a, a another refocus on redefining analysts to be a much broader set of people. Not just the people who build these forms of analysis, but also the people who consume them are being brought into that description in a more deliberate way. Anyone can be the analyst because at its heart, the, the metrics and the things we all track, uh, that they, they should be common within the business. And therefore, why are we gatekeeping that metadata and that information to just the people who build those solutions? They should be more broadly readily available. Um, to to more people and that's sort of again that's where the thought spot mentality comes in right um yeah. and, and to be fair many many analytics tools are having to add this element of capability to their product so you've had dbt come in with um the whole uh data modeling capabilities and metrics being uh, an important part of that and then from the other end you've had power bi has been doing metrics for a while you have tableau into the game with tableau pass essentially metrics you know with a with a big boost, with AI at the heart of it. Um, the key disappointment I have with this, though, is that it turns out the the big, the, the big, the fang, as it were, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, are still the only companies able to train their own models, right? Yeah. And fundamentally, everyone else is just a customer to those models at this stage where we're at. That the stuff is still too expensive. The NVIDIA GPUs are basically <laughs> not available unless you're one of these big companies with big checks. And so really every model we're looking at, and you know, if you take Tableau Pulse and we, we look at Tableau's use of AI as an example, it's using ChatGPT behind the scenes, which means it's limited by the scope yeah. of what Chat ChatGPT can do. It's not a model trained on Tableau's knowledge bases. It's not a model trained on yet <laughs> um, <laughs> all the calculations. But then the key thing is. How far are we away from that? And that's that's actually been my big disappointment. I thought when you know ChatGPT came out and GPT 3.5 was open source, I thought, wow, that's going to show the way to all these companies to get, even if you had GPT 3.5 levels of capability and you trained your own model, I assumed that would be attainable within the next year. Instead, it just turns out the existing models are moving faster and faster and faster, and no one else can get close to the hardware that you need to build the more basic things in the first place. Yeah. I think the other the other interesting area um, around GPT, especially, um, mm. is people didn't really know what to do with it first. Right. And then suddenly yeah. you have to do something. Like I think, um, may, I can't remember exactly, but maybe 2020, 2021, I think I shared with you like an early version of GPT. Um, oh, you did, and I completely dismissed it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did it on our work chat uh, convo at the time, right? I think it's probably still up. If you're at the Information Lab, go Google Ravi's post uh, about GPT. I think it was two point two point five. It was two. It was, um, it was early. It was. It was two. It was. Yeah, it was very early GPT. GPT yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've seen it. So, um, um, Got to give a shout out to Joe Mulberry who shared it onto onto my feed, and he was almost like, "This could be interesting." And I sort of thinking like, "Hang on, you've just given it a natural language prompt, and this thing has just gone away and done it for you, or assisted you to do this, yeah. based on everything that is learned and, and known in the past." I think the 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 problem you've got is the speed at which this is just splashed, right? Like it's come as yeah. an asteroid into the sea, and mm -hmm. there's a wave came, and everyone's trying to ride that wave. And sure they're doing something with it because every webinar, every person, every tech company, every even employee that I work with, are like, yeah, but how is AI going to change? This is like, you know, this is my smart question I can ask you. Um, and, and the real answer is, well, don't know. 
It, like yeah. it's, in in some cases, we we were using AI. In other cases, it doesn't make sense to use AI. And you have to be really purposeful, in my opinion, to start yeah. using the compute of this. The problem is, as I as I alluded to, you can't just stop as a tech company. You can't just be yeah. like, we're gonna kind of like work out what we're doing in this space. Yeah. That said, Google and Apple absolutely have stopped. Like the like Bard came Bard and Gemini came out. Apple still haven't really shown or done anything with with these. Yeah. Yeah. And they're almost like sitting there by silent being like, we've still got Siri, you can crack on with that. If we've got something good, we'll tell you. And it's almost the yeah. ability to to be solid there, I think. I think Apple and Google actually represent the challenge of many big companies have with AI, which is what do you do with that uh, across your product suite? Because Chat ChatGPT and OpenAI don't have existing products they need to integrate OpenAI with. So they actually built the most common interface that you would want to something like this. And they did that well. And that's why it took off. Everyone else like Google and Apple have the burden of having to need to integrate it with their technologies. And so that actually makes it Im immediately possibly more useful, but also immediately easier and harder to, to, to do well, because the, the bar you have to cross when you have a billion people on Gmail, the bar you have to cross when you have a billion iPhones, it's just so high. You can't just rock up to, I don't know, Anthropic and say, hey, can you run your model on an iPhone? Because as soon as you do that, yeah, it's 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 definitely expensive. <laughs> uh, you'd need a lot more. Nvidia would need to be five times bigger to keep up with the demand the iPhone alone would generate. So um, the really interesting challenge is that, and I think companies need to watch that space a little bit more closely because it's exactly how Google and Apple integrate AI into their businesses that are going to set the the standard for how you should do it within an analytics team or within a business uh, that, that's using analytics as a capability and wants to mobilize that data for the purpose of AI. Um, on the other hand, um, I think they've both realized they were bo both caught sleeping. Funny, Google was caught sleeping, GPT. They invented the T in GPT, Transformers. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, I think Google came from the side of caution and realized that there was actually an angle where if you're Google, yes, you have to be cautious, but if you're open AI and no one knows about you, you don't. And so you, know, be a lot more nimble, a lot more you can just a lot make more mistakes and have fair absolute fair. howlers because there's no damage to your reputation. But when it when you Google and that happens and you're, you know, pride yourself on cataloging the world, you can't make mistakes. They had a recent issue with um uh, their model generating non accurate uh, racial representations of historical um scenarios in society. I think there it was generating uh, Nazi so soldiers of color, uh, as an example, which was a pretty bad mistake. But you can see how you can see how some sort of dial on, um, you know, being equitable was dialed too far up, and that's how that mistake happens, right? Um, and, and Apple, on the other hand, well, they haven't done anything, and they, they they seem to be just publishing papers at the moment to kind of demonstrate that they're catching up. But as they say, you've not done anything until you've shipped, and the the challenge they have is actually. You know, out of the gate, there's probably only one model that can deal with the with the scale of, of the iPhone, and that is again ChatGPT. Many of the other models probably couldn't deal with that. Um, and so you have lots of different challenges all coming out at the same time. But yeah, uh, Apple and Google definitely caught sleeping. Um, <laughs> they're good case studies for Harvard Business Review, maybe in a couple of years' time when this is all shaken out and um, I mean, I mean, there are no more I'm apps. Really, yeah, I'm really excited for Google to really step into this game, though. Like. Genuinely, because like the, the the moment that Google Photos said, you know what, we're not going to be free anymore, was like, okay, they've got everything they need from all of your pictures, guys. Like <laughs> they, they've scanned <laughs> everyone's photos, yeah, and yeah. understood them at a high level for a long, 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 long time. And now they're like, yeah, we're going to charge for this. Or photos have become that's the cynical answer. The real answer yeah. could be photos have become and videos have become so big, hosting them doesn't make sense for for Google anymore. Yeah, but yeah. like Google have that as their cache of sort of image recognition and image development, and then you've also got on top of that the entirety of YouTube, <laughs> which just opens up an entire massive broad knowledge base of everything humankind have come up with. Um, Correct. Right, wrong, biased, unbiased, or like reviews, opinions, voices. All of this stuff is is real niches as well. Like 
I was listening to another uh, YouTuber and he was saying how like every niche has a video with like a million views or something like that. Like, and so if you have a niche and you don't find that video, you should just go make that video because it like YouTube will find a million people for you. And it's yeah, it's it's a very it's a very interesting problem. I, I will say that Google have have done a few things. It's just it's not at the same scale and impact as ChatGPT. I think because they're not the first mover advantage here. Gemini Pro, for example, I actually use this quite often and I, I like it. It's actually quite good at very specific types of tasks compared to ChatGPT. Um, its context window is a lot larger. That's a huge thing if you're trying to assimilate a lot of information. That said, um, the thing I keep hearing a lot about is, you know, things like Perplexisby, Anthropic, all of them are reaching mm -hmm. GPT-4 levels of capability today. And people assume that ChatGPT is just going to stand still for a while. And I know for a fact what will happen in two, three months is, uh, you know, Sam Altman, who at the moment feels untouchable, given that he might manage to survive his own ousting and, and come back to the to the company as CEO, um, is going to announce GPT-5. It's going to blow the world out. They announced Sora just, a, 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 you know, a month ago, and they're yeah. already partnering with people in Hollywood. Um, OpenAI Whisper is a great transcription model. We'll transcribe this podcast absolutely flawless. And you think actually the the, the group of models OpenAI is building, DALI, ChatGPT4, Sora, like actually, no, like one model from Google, one model from Apple is not going to compare to the, the, the momentum that ChatGPT has. And if they put all of that into one generalized model, that is going to be sensational. The hard bit, as you say, though, is stitching it all together, right? Yeah, Jarvis, right? Like from Iron Man, that, that's effectively yeah. what almost this this it could end up being. You know, with the Apple Vision Pro also coming along around the same time, you've got yeah. this. Like, may, maybe we start suddenly at a race or um, augmented reality again. Like Google Glass, that failed project might come back around again, um, because yeah. again, computationally, it's now these things are now possible. Like we Correct. understand computers better than we ever have done, and this will continue to grow and develop where like consumer electronics might be at their peaks, right? But yeah. it, it's now beyond consumer what, what's possible. What, and that's, yeah. that's quite exciting. I feel like hardware has, you're definitely right there. Hardware has peaked and it's now software that's kind of, it, all the frontiers is to do with software or processing power. But the hardware itself, everything else around the hardware is solved. Like, you know, we all know what a phone should look like and feel like. We know what a laptop should look like and feel like. All we're really debating now is what goes on in them, and that's that's exciting on one hand because these are these are sort of well known form factors, um, and AI has a potential with with the you know augmented reality example. I think AI is the absolute missing piece that augmented reality lacks. You remember like five years ago when we all had these AR apps on our phone? We thought, hey, look at me, I'm playing cards on the table, like very very basic stuff. Uh, then you take the meta glasses, the Ray-Bans, and you look at the video quality that's coming out of that. And then you hear that Facebook is going to put Llama inside of those glasses so you yeah. can talk to it. Then you're like, oh, I get it now. So you can ask the thing, what am I looking at? And it's going to tell you, give you the context. Well, now, now you're talking. Yeah. Now, antitrust, privacy, all of these things are really going to come <laughs> out and play now. Like, you're going to have to get some proper... Yeah legislation and people who understand tech to an nth degree and ethical technology because like even like, let's say the ray bands for example if someone's filming everyone that they see every conversation they have every day and then reviewing yeah. it that's creepy like it's not sorry it's not creepy it's it's, it's a violation of privacy and trust it is creepy <laughs> it, <laughs> the, yes it, it is creepy. creepy doesn't mean it's wrong there are lots of creepy things that are wrong, right? And yeah. um, and there are lots of creepy things that we we all do that we you know we get on with. Like in in the UK today, it's absolutely legal for you to go out and take a photo in public of anyone, no permission required. Uh, is it the same if you're wearing glasses that are constantly recording all day, right? Uh, and uh, is it the same if that that interaction is if that interaction then picks up a conversation, correct? That you yeah. are not a part of, correct? And but so, is it occurring so, in a public or private place? Like there's there's so many stipulations you have to unwind. Un like I said, this is for lawyers and smarter people than me, or that <laughs> more clout than me to, to yeah. jump into. Um, uh, antitrust, huge. Um, there is the ongoing antitrust stuff with Apple, and uh, you know, uh, 
the DMA in Europe, and we're not experts on that, so we won't go into that. I absolutely love those debates, by the way, because there's an Apple user who sits here getting frustrated with their iPhone, and the lack of integration of basic things that have been in Android for years uh, just don't appear on the on, on the iPhone. I'm like, this is why this company is too comfortable. They need a little bit of stress. Um, but you know what will happen? Um, we'll go through all of this, uh, you know, debates and and all that. Same with AI, I think. And we'll end up in a place that's worse than where we are today for both sides, both for the companies and for consumers. That's all that ever happens, right? You have Reject the EU with their cookie policy Reject thing, all cookies right? on every website. Yeah, exactly. And then the EU thought, oh, websites will stop putting cookies on their websites if we just tell them to ask the user. Nope. What did every company do? Ask you every single time. <laughs> like, it's the exact opposite. So GDPR, like I still get tons of spam and I'm, you know, you can do erasure requests all you want, but another data broker will just sell your data on and you're exactly. back, in, this, back this, into this, the thing. This is the, this, the way that um, telemarketers have found a way around this. They just use middlemen, right? Yes. Like you, you get a spam phone call, you tell them, don't use my details. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you got this from this company, you have to contact them. And then who then tell you to another one and another one and another one. And you just get stuck in this web and that what they're relying yeah. on is you not wanting to do that. Data um, breakers, yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've got a friend who like just <laughs> in the spirit of nudges that are barriers. I've got a friend who um had a beer fifty two, which is this beer subscription service, paying oh, yeah. thirty, twenty five pounds a month. Um and the way to cancel a subscription after the free trial is to ring them and I'll, and speak to someone and say, This is what I want to cancel. Now, being the millennial that we are. No one wants to pick up the phone and speak to a human being. <laughs> so just <laughs> kept rolling out of like, ah, oh, I don't really want to bring someone. Um, and then, yeah. What's it worth it, to you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. What, what is that worth to you? And, and it's creating, it's exactly that, creating that barrier. But on, 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 on trust, like, we, we've got an election coming up here in the UK this year, probably, um, maybe early next. And I, I just know disinformation videos and audio clips and all of these things are just going to yeah. be rife right yeah. like it's not it's not going to be quite like cassette boy that youtuber that did like splice things of um of politicians and, and alan sugar off the apprentice it's going to be to another level like you think if you even look at the small segments around um kate middleton and the 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 um, easter picture is it easter? photoshopping yeah like, yeah your know, know, mother's day it was mother's day wasn't it Photoshop plus that's not her plus that video of her um, giving her news is also AI. It's like, come on, guys. Wow. Like, and this is where going all the way back <laughs> yeah. to the start, yeah. NFTs and blockchain are going to have to become really come to the fore here. How do yeah. you have that trust of where that source came from? Um, you know, when you yeah. take a picture on your phone, you have all that, that information stored within the metadata. Like, how, how do you actually utilize that? You know, in a way, we're talking about data lineage in the real world, right? Like, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> to bring it back full circle. It's it's funny how the things we we deal with uh, for you at work, for me as like a consultant, lineage, understanding where something has come from, even at its most basic like um, form, that is not solved yet. Like, we have copyright, which is very much a data thing. You stamp an image, you you, you apply for a trademark, and that's what you go. We've now reached a point where that is no longer good enough in today's world. Um, you know, um, I, when I edit videos, hard there's to enforce, a tool. By the way. It's really hard Sorry? to enforce. I think it's very hard to enforce. Hard to enforce. Yeah. Yeah. It's not only hard to enforce. I don't think the laws that allow you to do anything with it. Right. Um, you know, in, in a very basic sense. So here's a, here's a very basic example that um, I kind of, I kind of use, let's say uh, I make a video and I post it on YouTube and it defames someone. So they come after me and they say, hey, you've defamed me. Here's the lawsuit. And I'll go, actually, that wasn't me. And I and they'll go, what do you mean? Uh, it wasn't me. Um, it was an AI. Uh, the script was actually automatically generated and it was, it was compiled from a bunch of sources which were pulled from public opinion. So um, if you want to go sue someone, um, sue public opinion. But I'm just using an AI to aggregate all these thoughts. Um, the only thing you can sort of probably go and do me for as a lawyer there is the fact that I have it on my channel on YouTube, but then enters TikTok. Okay. 
<laughs> then enters shorts, then enters all these platforms that have very disposable profiles and everything else. And then you've got what nothing do you to stand do? on. And what do you do in the instance where someone's taken a screen cap of your video uploaded to TikTok? Someone on Instagram has taken it off TikTok and put it on Instagram of the YouTube source, right? And yeah, you just exactly. get I mean, that you see this all yeah. the time. You see this all the time where yeah. like you're just watching a recording of someone else's video on someone else's account. Yeah. And that's how you're getting the, the numbers uptick. So uh so you need you need something that has to work across platforms. It has to be multi company. It has to work across if if you take social media example, you have to be YouTube, Instagram Reels, and TikTok, all of them. Not that these companies will ever collaborate with each other. TikTok's about to get banned in America. So um that 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 in itself is interesting. And then at a very sort of root level, like you and I were brought up in a world where we were we were taught the skills on how to discern whether information was trustworthy or not. Um, I'm not saying that those skills aren't still being taught today, but they're definitely harder to teach because the the pace at which information is being generated at far outweighs the uh, the pace at which any one person could um, you know sift through them. So even if you had the right skills, you and me today. Chat GPT could be creating tons of tons of tons of pieces of content. The election you talked about, probably the first election where I'd be surprised if fifty percent of the election material isn't created using some sort of AI assistance because it's dead easy to just put in a prompt and say, "Hi, I need a paragraph about this," so I can put it in a leaflet. And out it comes, and it's just a couple of edits, and off you go. Right before you hired interns to do this, you hired copywriters to do this, and. And you're still going to hire those people, but they might be editing instead of crafting, which is which is in itself interesting. I, I'm wondering whether, yeah, I mean, this this, this is this is why we brought the podcast back, right? <laughs> like <laughs> these conversations where we can just keep going and going and going, um, going, going endless. <laughs> and, and yeah, we... <laughs> but like as I said, I, I wonder if there's, you know, is there any any one or group of people who are really experts in this space, though, right? Like. I, I, I really you're looking for an academic that's thought about AI dystopian like in a dystopian manner and researched and written papers on it or group of researchers. You really want academics to have this conversation, be leading this. But the problem is who's listening to these academics, who's who's finding those papers and understanding no the, the right people and also then the decision makers. That like it's only been until recently that, you know, the BBC have got uh any sort of uh understanding of where people are watching iPlayer, right? Like there was legislation that meant that if you unplugged your laptop, I think someone had told me or uh I read somewhere, if you're using some a wife someone else's Wi Fi but your laptop or mobile device is unplugged, you're technically covered by the T V license you pay at home. So therefore for a university student, it would be that that would be like I I don't know what the ins and outs are, but like Legislation, I think, was then had then had to catch up a few years ago to then block those loopholes and those areas. Now, famously, legislation is really quick to to be designed, developed, and passed through any sort of government. Like. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's it's it's. I think yeah. it's such an interesting space that you know I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on, but it's I, it's going to have to be good. <laughs> I'll pull one out for the UK because we left the EU and all I'm going to say is that <laughs> I'd hate to be a tiny little island out in the middle of the sea trying to form its own opinion on this when <laughs> at the moment all the movements being done by what I can only describe our continent level groups there, EU, America, we're just going to have to conform to all of this stuff rather than feed into it. And even if you do, even if you do decide to come with a different policy to all these countries, they're just not going to listen. Um, it's just too small a market now compared to the rest of the, the block. And, in, and the only place you can enforce it is your own country. Because everyone else is like, exactly. well, no, <laughs> we use this one, as do yeah. 200 other countries. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll, keep, I'll keep, uh, keep pouring one out for that. But um, yeah. I think when we were doing our podcast, the debate had just settled, right? It just happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's funny. We probably started our podcast around about when the debate was actually going on and yeah. Here we are, um, three years later, back to talk about the effects. But hey, um, yeah. we should probably uh, probably call it there and start talking about what we're going to be doing next, right? So we've had a little bit of a chat today about AI. I think that was like the the topic that was top of our top of our mind. We talked a little bit about analytics as well. 
Um, going forward, we're going to try and do something every fortnight. So we're going to try and make sure we keep this uh, going. So um, two podcasts a month uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, YouTube and any other video platform that takes podcasts. We'll be doing that. We'll, we'll get the website back up. We'll do a little bit of a rebrand as well just to get, uh, you know, back in the day we called ourselves business intelligence professionals. I think um, they're just called data analysts uh, today. So <laughs> we, we can we can we can rephrase a few things and uh, uh, change things up. And you've also you've also left um, uh, the consulting space. So I think data analysts or something else of that kind is a little bit more fitting as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, uh, love love this debate. Love chatting to you, mate. Um, great Always. to have this. Great to have this back. Um, yeah, I can't wait. Looking for, looking forward to many many topics to be discussed. I think we've we've scratched ourselves some really interesting ones here. So no, um, let's do it again in two weeks. <laughs> Cheers, everyone.